this morning because we have about 2,000 graduates from ITS all over the world. And, and when we say we're equipping leaders, preparing leaders, really, we're preparing God's servants, right? It's not about the title. It's not how much money we make, because in ministry, it's not about the money, right? But really serving Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ will expand and, and, and carry it out. So today we want to recognize two alumnus of ITS who've been serving the Lord faithfully. Uh, and Dr. James Lee, I want to invite him to come and present two award uh, for our alumnus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tony, for that uh, introduction. And good, good day once again. Thank you for coming and attending our second day of Dr. Joseph Tang Reform Theology Lectures. It's good to see all of you. And it's my great uh, joy and privilege to announce uh, the recipients of ITS Distinguished Alum Award uh, for uh, this year. And the first person, first recipient is Reverend Dr. Joseph Morala. Can we uh, get a big round of applause? And I'd like to show on the screen. Uh, as you know, many of our alum are serving very faith faithfully and sacrificially all around the world, so they cannot be here to receive this award. But I'm going to go ahead and read their uh, bio so that you are familiar with their ministry and uh, amazing and impactful work that they have done for the kingdom of God. Uh, Reverend Joseph Morala has dedicated his life to advancing the kingdom of God and uplifting communities in need in India. In 1986, Reverend Dr. Morala graduated from International Theological Seminary with a THM degree. Following his graduation, Reverend Morala immersed himself in pastoral work and raising Christian leaders and nurturing and equipping believers with the transformative power of God's word. His unwavering commitment to the gospel led him to establish the Global Evangelical Ministries, GEM, in 2000, and it has become a light of hope in the heart of Andhra Pradesh in India. At the core of GEM, GEM's mission is to proclamation of the gospel and the establishment of Christ-centered communities among the Hindu population, with a team of devoted pastors and church planters by his side, Reverend Brala tirelessly ministered to the spiritual needs of his people, fostering growth and discipleship in 12 thriving churches. In addition to his pastoral duties, Reverend Brala is deeply invested in holistic community development. Through the grace of God, he has established a government-recognized school, providing quality education to impoverished children, nurturing their minds and hearts with Christian values. Driven by compassion and guided by faith, Reverend Morala extends a helping hand to vulnerable women in the community through the establishment of tailoring centers. He empowers widows and the marginalized, just as we talked about yesterday, offering them skill, training, and also opportunity to build sustainable livelihoods. Furthermore, Reverend Morales' ministry extends beyond physical and material needs as he organizes medical campaigns to provide free health care services to those who are sick and suffering. His acts of mercy and compassion reflects the love of Christ, touching lives and transforming communities. Under Reverend Morales, Visionary leadership, GEM has experienced remarkable growth and impact from the planting of 15 churches to the establishment of a thriving campus and staff housing and a school serving over 230 students. His legacy of faith extends to his own family. His, he has two sons and Avery Morala graduated from ITS with THM in 2019. And Joshua is currently working on his THM. Through their academic pursuit at ITS, they embody the generational call to serve God's people and proclaim the truth. 
Reverend Morales' life is testament to God's faithfulness and the transformative power of God's love. And we're very grateful and thankful and praise God for his ministry. So thank, uh, we'd like to thank Reverend Morales. If you get to see this video, we'd like to congratulate you and also give praise to, to God for your faithful ministry. God bless you and your family. Now the next recipients of our uh, ITS Distinguished Alum Award are Dr. Bakari Ibrahim Bunga and Dr. Lami Bakari. We are very proud of uh, this couple who are uh, alumni of ITS. Uh, many of you do know uh, their just amazing ministry in Nigeria. Dr. Bunga, Bakari Bunga was born on uh, March 15, 2000, I mean, not 2000, 1956. <laughs> <laughs> I know he looks very young, but he's not that young. Um, you know, he was born into a steam family of Malam Bunga and Maimuna uh, Musa in the village of Rumem, nestled within the uh, local government area of Gombe State in northern eastern Nigeria. He was raised in a very strict Islamic tradition, and Dr. Bakari commenced his educational journey at a traditional Islamic school where he diligently memorized Quranic verses and faithfully observed the five daily prayers. And from the age of 10, he began herding goats and later transitioned to shepherding his family's diverse animals, including goats and sheep. Now, as he um, continued on his uh, educational journey, he decided to pursue Western education in a Christian community in a late neighboring village. Uh, initially, because he was uh, raised in a Muslim background, had a, a bias and prejudices against Christians. But as he encountered Christian love, their warmth and joy and care for one another, he encountered the profound message of Jesus Christ. And through the sharing of Mr. Kephas William, he decided to um, commit his life to Jesus Christ in 1975, in spite of uh, his family opposition and persecution. 1985, he married uh, Dr. Lami Gami, uh, Lami Gani, and they've been blessed with many children and grandchildren. And his desire for further knowledge has taken them to ITS, and they graduated together with a degree in theology and church ministries. Uh, through uh, his uh, career, he has served dil diligently in diverse capacities within the Evangelical Missionary Society of ECWA, uh, spanning from field missionary and church planter to director of administration and manager of city ministries. And his uh, commitment to ministry and leadership also was exemplify his roles as a chairman of ECWA core North Gospel Implementation Board and his continual membership in EMS management. Um, he also recently, uh, probably many of you heard about his ministry uh, to really um, uh, free many people who were kidnapped by the um, Muslim extremists and he had to risk his life but he was able to rescue many people by God's grace. And he, uh, although he was very fearful, he always really prayed to God and praised to God for how he was preserved uh, as he was ministering to these people. And uh, he is currently serving as our board member. He is an a, a advocate and is a firm believer in ITS mission. We are very grateful for his faithful ministry. Uh, Dr. Lami Bakari holds PhD in intercultural studies from Trinity International University. And also he received THM in practical theology from ITS. And uh, they, um, uh, Dr. Uh, 
uh, Bakari is a founding leader of both the Christian Women Development Network International and the Priscilla Group. Throughout her career, she has demonstrated a firm commitment to education by founding two schools, serving as a hospital chaplain, and actively participating in the establishment of seven churches alongside her husband. Her significant contrib contributions extend beyond her practical involvement in this minis her ministry. Dr. Bakari, or Dr. Um, Bakari, is the author of Women right in Mission, right here, a exploration of the legacy of women within SIM, formerly known as Sudan Interior Mission, and the Evangelical Church Winning All, Equa. And in her book, she narrates amazing testimonies of the ministry of women in northern Nigeria, and she continues to exemplify the leadership in her serving and teaching um, in Nigeria. So we are very grateful for uh, this couple's faithful ministry in Nigeria, and we praise God. And um, uh, they set up such a wonderful example for all of us to follow, and we just pray for God's blessings and protection over their family and their ministry. So these are the recipients, and um, I'm so happy and glad that uh, we are able to recognize these, uh, our alum uh, this year. So praise God. Thank you. OK. Yes, this time I'd like to invite Dr. Bonat uh, to come and introduce our speaker. And uh, Dr. Bonat. Hi everyone, you are all welcome. We appreciate God so much for this um, time of refreshing. Yesterday, if you were here, I believe that um, you were blessed. I was really blessed. One thing that I will live to remember is to welcome everyone we see. Because we are all created in the image of God. So it's a privilege for me to introduce our speaker. Yesterday he was introduced, but for the sake of those who are not here yesterday, I will introduce him. <coughs> our speaker is Dr. Paul Shang Halim. He's an award-winning historian with particular focus on historical manifestations of the reformation of the British Atlantic world. His book, Mystery Unveiled, The Crisis of the Trinity in Early Modern England, Oxford 2012, won the Roland H. Benton Prize as the best book in history or theology by the 16th Century Society and Conference in 2013. He has also written two other books, including the Cambridge Companion to Puritanism, 2008, which he co-edited with John Coffey, and In Pursuit of Purity, Unity and Liberty, Richard Baxter's Puritan Exclusiology in its 17th century context, Brill 2004. He is wrapping up research and writing on another book, this time dealing with debates on the identity of Jesus Christ in Enlightenment England. His research has been sponsored by fellowships from the Luce Foundation, the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, the Louisville Institute, the Archbishop Kramer Fund from Cambridge University, the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, the Lilly Faculty Grant, and the Vanderbilt University Research Scholars Grant. He is also a popular speaker with one of his videos reaching 2 million views. He has been teaching at Vanderbilt University since 2006 and has also taught at the University of Chicago, Gordon Conwell Seminary, Cambridge University, and Yonsei University. He also serves as the scholar in residence at Christ Presbyterian Church in Nashville. 
He has earned degrees from Yale University, BA, Princeton Seminary, THM, and University of Cambridge, PhD. Dr. Lim is, firm, is a firm believer that all true theology has to be eschatologically grounded and founded in the glory and grace of the triune God and loves to engage in learning with his students and colleagues wherever they are from. He has taught in Tennessee's maximum security prison for the past 10 years and regards it in his favorite place of learning and growing closer to the Lord of all truth, goodness and beauty. So we appreciate God. Thank you so much for um, this um, expounding, you know, the scriptures alongside um, John Calvin's uh, theology. We are really, really grateful. And we appreciate God for great men of God, you know, who brought the truth of God's words to bear in their own generation. It is my sincere prayer that the Lord will also help us, you know, to play our own role before we join the Celestial Assembly. So can you, um, can we put our hands together as we welcome our... Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, um, hope you can hear me fine in this room and also in other places as well. Um, well, welcome back for those of you who are back. And uh, well, um, great to see you. I uh, just have to keep pressing that. Thing. I don't know why that keep pops, <laughs> popping up, but there you go. All right, well, um, yesterday we talked a, a good bit about John Calvin and uh, his uh, legacy, both here in the United States and also in different parts of the world. The particular theme of yesterday's conversation was about uh, Calvin's perspective on the most vulnerable of the ancient Near Eastern world, which would be refugees, uh, foreigners, orphans, and widows. But we also talked about it in his 16th century context and furthermore, thanks to your input during our Q&A time, we're able to imagine together what that looks like in our context of post-coloniality and, and as we are also thinking about loving God with our heart, mind, and soul, and our learning. And I was telling a couple of friends yesterday and today that what I found deeply um, intriguing, in fact, superbly exciting, is that we were talking about post-colonial and evangelical in the same breath. Uh, you either talk about one or the other in a lot of contexts that I know, but here I think being able to do that together was really invigorating for me. So thank you for that experience and opportunity to learn together with you. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to talk about some, we're going to go back before the Protestant Reformation. Because a lot of times one of the major debates during the Reformation context was where was your church before Luther? Right, so where was your church before Luther? Uh, was the Catholic repost toward the Protestants uh, in different parts of Europe and beyond? And also, uh, that became a rallying cry of many of the Protestants to say that, well, our church is, goes all the way back to the times of Jesus. And so, which is uh, indeed the kind of argument that was uh, bolstered both from the Catholic and Protestant side. And one of the things that we're not going to settle the score here today, but what I think would be very important for us to engage is that both Catholics and Protestants in the Reformation context went and kind of, you know, argued from the texts of and interpretations from Augustine of Hippo. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Augustine, a North African Christian, and we're going to think about what it means for him to think about God and the sort of communion with God and what that might mean for us today is going to be um, the kind of focus. So, all right, so um, we're going to do a little bit of a, a, a going back and forth. So we're, we're not staying in the 16th century today as we did yesterday. We're going to, in fact, gonna, we're going to go to the 13th and then 4th and 5th centuries. All right, so we're going to go to Italy in the 13th century, and after that, we're going to go to north, uh, 4th and 5th centuries in North Africa, modern-day Tunisia, and, and, uh, and so on. Well, um, so there are these two words, exitus and reditus. This idea came from uh, other people, but really kind of codified and, and became more prominent in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. So this Italian uh, Dominican friar or monk, 
who devoted his life to learning and loving God, learning about God and writing about God, but also worshiping and loving God. And so he said, okay, everything comes from God. Everything comes out of God. Thus the term exitus, I, I, you know, as in like coming out or like exiting. So everything comes from this triune God. And then everything also then returns to this God. So exitus and reditus, right? And if you actually, that to me became a very, very helpful binary and simple format of understanding all things contingent in this universe, right? Everything comes from God and everything returns to God. I'm in my middle 50s, so that means I'm probably returning to God right now, right? I mean, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm definitely half uh, past my halfway point, so I am on, on my way back to God. And one of the things that has been really salutary for me to realize that I'm returning to God is that I've been able to kind of declutter my own sense of self and significance and all of that so that, you know what, I'm actually on my way to God, on my, on my way back to God. And so everything returns to the source of all the triune God. And I think it is really important for us to think about that dynamic and think about your life journey in the context of that, whether you're from Malawi or Nigeria or Kenya or China or United States of America or India or Nepal or Pakistan, or if I have missed a, a country in, in the litany of the countries somewhere in Eastern Europe or somewhere like, you know, Pardon me, but we, we have come from God and we are on our way back to God. So, and, and en route to that, we are right now, you know, kind of gathered together, at least in person here in Southern California and over Zoom and other venues from different parts of the world. And so thinking about your particular location and your particularity in light of who God is and what God is up to. Right. So all of human endeavors, cosmic events, seen and unseen, are moving ever so steadily and surely to the source of all. And I want you to really think about that dynamic movement and put yourself in that. Because a lot of times we may not have the, the, the kind of uh, um, opportunity or willingness to do that. And um, so where are you going and how self-conscious of it are you? You might say, well, I'm going to get a degree here at ITS. I am teaching here at ITS. I'm, I'm administrating here at ITS. I have something to do with this particular institution. Or if you're joining from different contexts, maybe you're doing something somewhere. So how self-conscious are we about our daily movements? Key human endeavor, I think, is, you know, we, we like to tell stories. I like to tell stories, and I think many of us do as well, and to offer accounts that help make better sense of our world. And one way of thinking about theology is that, to tell stories about God so as to make better sense of God's story and our story and the sort of uh, um, interplay between the two. Augustine of Hippo lived between 354 and 430. I think he probably shaped Western Christianity more than anyone else, uh, you know, arguably, and, and, and we, we might or might not have known that, and that's okay. Um, we're going to talk about how he kind of constructed these kind of a skeletal structures of how to think about human history and our own stories therein. So one of the ways to think about that is how he thought about two cities and two loves. He said when Rome, the city of Rome was sacked and basically captured by the Visigoth, and the Roman citizens and Roman kind of elites began to say, well, we actually became like this, weakened and vitiated, because we have adopted Christianity. So Augustine was having to respond to this criticism about Christianity. And so he wrote this book called The City of God. And in that, he basically says there are two cities and two loves. We'll look at that in just a little bit. And then he also kind of spent a lot of time talking about the source and the origin of evil and suffering, right? And so he kind of talked about the fact that our suffering, the source of our suffering or evil is uh, he kind of talked about it metaphysically as privation, perversion, and pride. That evil as an entity is parasitic. It doesn't have its own substance. It is always borrowed from the good. Therefore, this whole idea of privation or parasitic. And the other is perversion, that we uh, kind of distort and, and, and uh, basically make it grotesque, that which is good and true and beautiful, thus the term perversion but also pride in terms of how we at heart 
one of the reasons of our fall is that we did not let God be God, that we somehow wanted to take the shortcut into becoming like God. And so for Augustine, one of the ways to think about his own kind of entire uh, works uh, would be that he really talks a lot about love as the only antidote to our present malady, whether it was in 4th century, 5th century North Africa, or in 21st century global context here in North America and beyond. I want to actually, before I go on, I want to show you a picture of Augustine. I think that may be of some, right, okay. I'm going to show you this slide, right, okay. So people have been debating as to what did he actually look like, okay? And I think the closest one, and this is the earliest artistic rendition of what Augustine might have looked like. This is from the sixth century kind of uh, uh, um, a text that actually kind of describes him that way, what depicted him that way. The one on the far left is, is a 20th century rendition. The one on the far right is a medieval kind of a reproduction or rendition of what Augustine looked like. Now, why is that so important? I think in some ways it is important because um, what somebody looked like and uh, is going to be important, like how one is kind of thought of and how one is remembered, right? So he is often seen as a patron saint of Western Christianity. We often do not realize that he actually is from North Africa. North Africa, that means that he probably did not look like any one of us in this room. I mean, some of you are from Africa. You probably know if you're from Algeria or Morocco, they cut, you know what I mean? Like, they look more like Berbers. What's that? Very dark. Very dark, yes. Very dark. Okay, right. But they probably don't look like you. You know what I mean? So, so then, then the colors of some patron saint just seems to have brought up some kind of uh, lots of animus about, okay, owning him to our tradition, right? So, so I think a lot of times, um, like many of you did not know that Calvin was a refugee. Many people do not know that Cal, I mean, Augustine was North African, right? And then, and I've gotten kind of very different responses whenever I talk about the fact that Augustine was North African. For example, some of the African American students and, and, and friends that I have, um, they get actually excited to learn that, oh, he was actually North African. And then some other people learning that he was North African, it's like, really? Because I thought he was white. Right, you know what I mean? So back and forth. And so I do think that we're not going to have a de definitive answer as to what he looked like, but I think something like in the middle might be a good way, sort of halfway between the left and the right, right? And so um, on that uh, note, we'll go back to this uh, slide right here, okay? Um, so on two cities and loves. And I want us to pay attention to how he argues this kind of uh, uh, philosophy of history. He says, not from the very beginning, but since the human fall, there have been two cities, two cities that have been formed by two loves. The earthly city was formed by the love of self. It is ultimately about me even to the contempt of God or hatred toward God. The heavenly city is formed by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. That when push comes to shove, I'm gonna actually exalt in the city of man or city, the earthly city, myself. But in the city of God, when push comes to shove, who gets exalted to the, to, to, to the very top is going to be God himself. The former glories in itself, the latter in the Lord. For the one seeks glory from men, but the greatest glory of the other is God. The one lifts up its head in its own glory. The other says to its God, you are my glory and the lifter of mine head. That's out of the Psalms. In the one, the princes and the nations is subdued are ruled by the love of ruling. In the other, the princes and the subjects serve one another in love. So I think it's a very, very important kind of binary kind of contrast. The city of the earthly city and the heavenly city. The city of humans and city of God, right? And he kind of presents that as a very important typology of looking at the way that the ups and downs or the vicissitudes of history. 
He says, you need to actually see this in a very, very simple binary. There's a city of humans, city of men, and the earthly city, and the city of God, and the heavenly city. Right? So from universal to particular, then from the city of God is another kind of, his kind of masterpiece that we have just seen from here is book 14, chapter 28. From that, there's another one that is also, he's, he's known for his uh, literal meaning of Genesis, his uh, commentaries on Psalms, but also his sermons on John, and also his uh, confessions, as well as Enchiridion. He's written kind of quite a lot, but he was also a pastor. He was also a bishop of Hippo. That, that meant that he was in charge of and care, caring for souls of those who belong to his um, kind of Episcopal his uh, under his episcopate right that means he was the bishop and he was kind of in charge of many other pastors and priests who are serving uh, the laity in love and in humility and joy and this is what he said this is a pretty well-known text isn't it you stir men uh, to take pleasure in praising you because you may you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you that's how he begins uh, his confessions, book one, chapter one, section one. That God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are always going to be restless until they find their rest in you. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems that we have, we have found ourselves as restless society. There is a very interesting Korean-German philosopher by the name of Han Byung-chul, and he wrote this book called uh, Burnout Society. And it's a very important book published by Stanford University Press. And he's a, so he's a Korean uh, a scholar who moved to Germany to study metallurgy. But then while he was in, in Germany, he decided that he wants to study philosophy to his, to the, his parents' chagrin. They're like, what? You know, philosophy doesn't make you any money. What are you doing? And, but he has been teaching philosophy at, in, 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 in Germany. And he, in, in, the, in the book, uh, Burnout Society, he says, you know what? In today's context, he wrote this book about six, seven years ago maybe a little uh, before that, maybe 10 years ago, he says, we have a burnout society because of the technological advances, it has liberated us in many regards. But then it also has enslaved us in many other regards. And more than anything else, what we have are restless souls, as well as burnout kind of bodies. And we have experienced a lot of burnouts. And we'll talk about mental health later on in our presentation, actually, because I don't know about you, uh, um, there was, um, there were four uh, students who, uh, who took their lives at, at, a, at a college in, in Massachusetts, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, WPI, very, very good school. And then, so we have a mental health crisis in our country and maybe in our world. And, and a lot of teenagers and students in their universities and colleges and adults uh, are struggling with their own self because they feel in many ways restless. And isn't that interesting that Augustine begins his book, his autobiography called Confessions, by saying, you have made us for yourself, and we will remain restless until we find our rest in you. I want us to kind of think about that, how to find our ultimate rest. Where do you rest and how do you rest? You know, people have asked me today, did you rest well? Yes, I did rest well because I had a good bed and I was able to talk to my wife a couple of times and, you know, I was able to, you know, do, do things that I kind of do to relax and rest. There's a physical rest, but also there is a kind of the rest of the, the whole self, right? How do I actually rest? You know, because you may be resting physically, but mentally and emotionally and relationally, you might be disturbed or perturbed. Then how do we then move from a positions of dis disturbance or dis-ease to rest? And Augustine helps us to think about that. He starts off with this restless, restlessness, and he also talks about this thing called disordered desire. So what he's going to do as a doctor of the soul is to say that we have our fundamental problem is that we have misdirected or disordered desires. What I want, and you probably are familiar with Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul makes this kind of confession, right? What I want to do, I don't do. And what I shouldn't do, right, uh, I end up doing. And what does he say? Oh, what a wretched man I am, who will deliver me from this body, this mortal body, right? And then how does Romans chapter 8 begin? Therefore, you're right. 
there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So on the one hand in Romans chapter, and we're not talking about two different Pauls or two different, no, he's actually talking about his own self. It is like, you know, the thing that he should do, he doesn't do. The thing that he loathes doing, he ends up doing. And he says, I'm a mess. As we say in the South American South, I'm a hot mess and I don't know what to do about that. And so Augustine also talks about that from his own life. So then, um, return to God and idol construction. So he says, so basically, both Calvin and Augustine have talked about idols, talked a lot about idols because the Bible talks a lot about idols. Right? I mean, one of the Ten Commandments, right? Well, what is it? That you shall not make idols, I mean, right, for yourself. Then not make any graven images of God and so on because making idols and worshiping idols is going to be very, very detrimental, in fact, destructive of your own self, because it's going to take you away from not only yourself, but also from your Savior, right? And so uh, it says, a soul that turns away from you, Augustine writes, therefore falls into fornication, spiritual fornication. And, and when it seeks apart from you, what it can never find in pure and limpid form, except by returning to you. Notice that language of return. See, Augustine recognizes that we have a problem. We have a problem in that humankind, that is, human race, in its entirety. We have a problem because we don't know that we should be returning. And then, and then we don't know that we don't know that, that we should be returning. Many of us don't know how to return, and many of us don't know to whom we shall return. So that that and we are kind of in this morass. All those who wander far away and set themselves up against you are actually imitating you, but in a perverse way. Meaning this, he says, you know, that's what idols are. We become our own idols. We become our own kind of, you know, kind of, uh, we deify ourselves and we say, you know, I am, I am basically my own savior. I am my own God, you know, because I don't need other gods because other gods have really disappointed me. I don't know about you, but I, I, I serve in a context at a university where a lot of students call themselves ex-evangelicals, right? ex-evangelicals like i used to be an evangelical but now i'm not because of the pastors or priests or people around me have really disappointed me they were supposed to show me the beauty and the truth and the goodness of the gospel but in fact they've shown me the you know the the grotesqueness and the bestiality of the gospel and i don't want to have any, anything to do with that so augustine is really big on the fact that I, we can only return to god like so we can only we can only find our true identity by our return. It is about pivoting. It is how we pivot back to the source of all beauty, truth, and goodness. So then, how do we come to this place? And so, in this very interesting story, uh, if, and he, if, I want to encourage you while you're in school here at ITS, uh, maybe you can pick up, you can actually read it online. If you go to just Google Augustine Confessions PDF, it'll come up, or you can, it's not that expensive. Um, you know, maybe I'll send a few extra, because I, I do have several copies of, of Augustine's Confessions. And it actually, he talks about when he was 16 years old. He says, when I was 16, and he goes, let me tell you how silly and insane and inane sin is. And I'm going to explain to you, he says, by talking about what I did when I was 16 years old. Do you remember what you did when you were 16 years old? Are you doing some wonderful things or woeful things or something in between? Maybe a little bit of both. I don't know, right? So it says, late one night, he says, having prolonged our games in the streets until then. So he was hanging out with his friends until late night, as our bad habit was. And so he writes about this in his early 40s, right? So, and he's kind of looking back. And so his life is always kind of retrospective. He's looking back on what he was and what he did, and he always looks at it in light of God's grace. He says, I've had plenty of misdirected desires and disordered desires, but then what the gospel does, what my relationship with God does, is that it'll continually, continually and surely redirect my desires. Right, because my, my desire is often mislocated and misdirected, and so God's job is relocating and redirecting. So a group, group of young scoundrels, he says, and I was among them, the scoundrels, went to shake and rob this tree. What kind of tree is that? Right? And how many of you are familiar with this story? I'm curious. One, 
out of this room, two, okay, that's great, three, okay, three out of, that's wonderful, then this is going to be new to you, all right? So then, you know what he does? He and his friends go to somebody else's, you know, like, one of the beautiful things about Flor, I mean, California, are there some, tree, like, fruits over there? I mean, I've seen some, like, you know what I mean, like, the oranges, and, like, I was like, I wanted to actually, I, you know, my friend Alan was driving me over, I saw some wonderful uh, citrus trees, orange trees, and it's somebody else's house. And I knew I was talking about Augustine. And for a split second, because one of the trees looks so beautiful, so luscious. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to go there, shake the tree, because that's what he and his friends did. He go to someone else's orchard, someone else's house, and he sees this beautiful pear tree, and they just shake up the tree. And then they shook, they shook it up, and then the fruits fell. Guess what he did? He says, the malice meaning what he did was terrible, loathsome, and I loved it, okay? I was in love with my own ruin. Notice how he's writing about that. In love with decay and destruction, not with the thing for which I was falling into decay, but with decay itself. Notice how he's kind of like dissecting his own kind of, with this kind of a, you know, a, a metaphysical precision. He's actually talking about what was really wrong with him, right? He says, I didn't really, like, what did I love about it? Nothing except for the fact that I was doing something wrong. If I were to tell you, hey, do not think about a gray elephant. Do not think about it. What are you going to think about it right now? Gray elephant, there's something about how we are wired that always, always like this, right? So those pears are beautiful, but they were not what my miserable soul loved. Ah, the pears look beautiful, but that's not what I wanted. I had plenty of better ones. Notice that, right? He says, I had better ones. But why did I love this thing? I plucked them only for the sake of stealing. For once picked, I threw them away. Notice, I mean, so, I mean, if I didn't, I'm telling you, I did not go to someone else's house and shook their, you know, kind of orange tree. But if I did, like, just for the pure delight of stealing something or doing something wrong, I feasted on the sin, he says. Nothing else, and that I relished and enjoyed. And what he's getting at is he's getting to the core of what we often do. What we often do like, is not that we think it, that the thing is so sinful. It's that what was it then that I loved in that theft, he asked himself. Like, what did I love about that? Okay? And, there, and I was imitating my Lord, even in a corrupted and perverted way. He says, I was actually imitating my God because I wanted to be in control of my actions. Did I wish, if only by gesture, to re rebel against thy law, even though I had no power to do actually to do that, so that even as a captive, I might produce a sort of counterfeit liberty by doing with impunity these that were forbidden in a deluded sense of omnipotence. Like, there's a lot there, right? So what is he saying? He says, okay, I wanted to experience what it means to be controlled even for a split second. I wanted to defy gravity the theological gravity, metaphysical gravity of God being in charge, and I am called to delight in God's law, but I wanted to break that. And what I loved about shaking that pear tree was that I was shaking it. That I didn't really, and he says, none of us ate those pears. Notice that they didn't, nobody ate the pears. What did they like about it? They just liked the fact that they were transgressing that boundary. The mere, and he says, that's what he says right here, right? It was, I loved it, right? I loved it because the malice to what I did was terrible, and I loved it. What did you love about it? The fact that I was transgressing God's laws. That means, in a way, I am producing a sort of fake liberty by doing with impunity these were that were forbidden, and in a deluded sense of omnipotence. I'm, I'm in charge. I can do all things. Behold this servant of thine, he says, fleeing from his Lord and following a shadow. I love the way he puts it. He says, okay, you're not actually following a substance, you're following a shadow. And he's always going to say, okay, for people in your churches and people like you and me, let's start, forget people in your churches. Start with you, let's start with me. We often follow the shadow. We often do not follow the sun, but we follow the shadow. And then, so we think we're doing the right thing and we're not actually doing the right thing. So there is that tension. So what Augustine is doing and what I find Augustine so helpful. So 
both Catholics and Protestants agree that Augustine is superbly helpful. And then as this uh, Princeton theologian by the name of B.B. Warfield said that, um, that the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, was primarily a debate about Augustine. And then it actually is the triumph of Augustine's theology of grace over against Augustine's theology of the church. So his soteriology triumphing over his ecclesiology. That's a lot of very interesting thing right there that Warfield said. But so all of that to say that Augustine is sort of the, 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 the very important figure, I think of all the church fathers, the one that was debated more often and cited more often than any other church fathers is Augustine. And Augustine here, the reason why I've chosen these set of texts is to really kind of introduce us to the very beginning of what he deemed to be the fundamental problem of the humankind. And that is, we seek to be gods ourselves. We want to be God. We want to play God. We want to imitate God in a perverted way. And in so doing, we think that we're experiencing that liberty, that counterfeit liberty. And I love the way he put it, or as I often call it, fake, fake freedom. You think you're free, but you're not. And so then what he says is you need to always be pivoting back to God. Remember, exitus and reditus. Everything comes out of God, everything comes from God, and everything is returning to God. That means every day there is a daily ritual, daily ritual of recognizing that I have come from God. God has given you that breath to breathe. God has given you the ability to think and to wake up. And then at the end of the day, we are returning to God. Because I don't know about you, but when I go to sleep, do I have the, the certainty that I'll wake up the next day? I do not. I make plans. I set up my alarm clock, and I need to get up by 8 o'clock today or tomorrow. But I don't have the certainty, right? Certainty that I will, in fact, wake up. You probably have heard of people who died in their sleep. So that means that every time you wake up in the morning, you have actually participated in a small kind of minuscule and, and real way the glory of the resurrection. Wake up, O soul, and from your slumber. And we were able to wake up from our slumber. And Augustine says all of these daily motions are actually saturated with God's grace. So then it really helps me to recognize that, you know what? It's not just about being saved that matters, but the fact that I'm able to awake, you know, uh, you know be, be, uh, wake up from my sleep, the, way, the fact that I can move about in the room and in this planet, you know, on this planet Earth, the fact that I can think, the fact that I can deliver a talk, the fact that you can listen, the fact that we can do all of these things are actually kind of proofs of God's presence with us and God's, God leading us ultimately to God himself, right? And so what Augustine will say is that we have a problem. We have, and I'm, I'm in my middle 50s, so there's an there's a 80s uh, duo called Tears for Fears. And they had a song called Everybody Wants to Rule the World. I'm sure almost none of you know, maybe Professor here, maybe James, you might know that song, a couple of you might, but Everybody Wants to Rule the World. And I love that song because it is so, so appropriate as a descriptor of how we are. Everybody wants to rule the world. That means you and me. If given the opportunity, how will you rule this world? And so how do we solve this pernicious quandary? Everybody wants to rule the world, but then remember, two cities and two loves, right? So remember how we talked about it earlier, that, um, that there are two cities formed by two loves. The earthly city has been formed by the love of self, and the heavenly city is formed by the love of God. And we need to kind of think about that and Think about what that looks like. Because, again, it is that love of God or love for God. I want to kind of close by talking about something that goes even before Augustine. There's a very interesting book that I want to recommend to you. Uh, this is uh, written by Professor Larry Hurtado. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. He was, taught, he was uh, for a long time, professor of uh, New Testament at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He wrote this book and the title says it all. Why on earth did anyone become a Christian in the first three centuries? Because Professor Hurtado is arguing that it was actually countercultural, in fact, counterintuitive for a Roman citizen or pagan. Pagan is not a derogatory term, it just means that someone was not Greek, right? But pagan to become a Christian, right? 
And then, so uh, Professor Otaro says, furthermore, and he says two things really matter to these early Christians, uh, to these converts to Christianity. One, above all, is that they were told that, hey, this God who is the source of all things actually cares about you and loves you. I became a Christian when I was in college. I grew up, you know, sort of non-Christian, went to church, you know, when I was in high school, but that actually drew me away from, um, you know, Christianity in some ways. The thing that really boggled my mind and still boggles my mind right now is that this creator of these hundreds of billions of galaxies knows you, knows me, loves me, and loves you. If, I don't know if that, whether that actually amazes you, but to me, like, why would God do that? Augustine says something like this. Augustine says, oh Lord, you are actually closer to me than I am to myself. You know me better than I know myself. You love me more than I can ever love myself. That God is this God of Augustine. And this God is the God that our famous, your famous alums, you know, faithful servants of the Lord in Nigeria or India or elsewhere in the world, your alums and you are doing what you're doing because of the fact that the love of God has transformed your lives and is transforming your life. So, uh, Hurtado says, there, furthermore, this God sought a loving relationship with people in which a corresponding love for this deity was the central responsibility. What is the greatest commandment? Love God and love your neighbor, right? So loving God was a covenantal reciprocal responsibility. God has loved you, right? And that's what he says, you know, that uh, here, you know, that a God is, God is the redeemer, but also he's the lover. So as this professor, uh, Ramsey McMullen, uh, right? Loving gods or love for gods simply did not figure in pagan piety. That it wasn't something that, you know, first century, second century, third century Roman citizens or Greek citizens did, like what thought was conceptually possible or desirable or true. But the early, you see what I mean? I want you to really think about that. I want you to really think about, I was flying from Nashville to LA and I happened to sit next to a, a pilot, right? And we got talking a little bit, and he was talking about I, one of my first questions was, hey, do you think we'll get to the stage where it'll be no, no more human pilots, but robot is like, I hope not, he says, because I'll be out of a job. And then I said, okay. And then we were talking about the fact that, and, and he said his, um, he's been flying for the last 30 years as a pilot for 30 years. And he says, my hobby is I'm really into astronomy. I said, oh, that's great. And then he goes, when I look out the window, and so, you know, I see all of these stars, and I, I ask him, so since you're into astronomy, how many galaxies are there in our universe? It was probably hundreds of billions. And then I stopped right there, and I thought to myself, okay, if there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, and if God, if your theology of creation says God made them all, okay, however God did, but God made them all, I mean, think about, I mean, I don't even know about you, but I have a hard time even conceptualizing the number 100 billion. Right? And not just number, but galaxies. Not, not just stars, but galaxies, right? And if this God that we are talking about right now, God of astronomy, is also the God of, God of your life, who actually loves you. I don't know about you, but it sends like chills down my spine that this God knows me and cares about me. Cares about life in Malawi, cares about life in, you know, uh, Zimbabwe or like, where are you from, sir? Cameroon. So Cameroon, Malawi, and, you know, like you were in China for a while. And then, you know, wherever you are, like wherever you are, God cares about these things. And as it says in Genesis 1.28, God actually creates this covenantal kind of outsourcing. It says, I want you to go and multiply, be fruitful and multiply. And God actually gives humans a sort of covenantal res responsibility that I want you to actually become co-regents with God, partners in this covenantal task of fulfilling creational mandate, cultural mandate, right? God actually says, I love you and I know you and I'm going to give you a job. 
And to me, again, it really boggles my mind. As Ramsey McMullen says, loving gods or love for gods simply did not figure in in pagan piety. Then how did this God show his love? All right, then we're going to turn and look at two pictures and we're done. Christ as victim and Christ as victor. Okay, so early Christianity, so this is from a, a Rebula Gospels, a 6th century illuminated Syriac Gospel book. So we we're talking about Eastern Christianity, and then we're going to look at uh, this thing later on as well. But okay, so here, what do you notice? Um, is there anything different between Jesus and the two around? It's not a rhetorical question. You can maybe <laughs> help answer. Like, see the picture right there, right? So Jesus and the two, uh, two next to him who are crucified. They're all crucified. So that's the commonality. What, what are some things that look different to you? Right. Jesus is clothed in the way that these two are not, and he has a halo as a way of kind of setting him apart. But the commonality is that they're all crucified. And as we talked about briefly yesterday, the crucifixion is Rome's way of flexing its muscles and saying, we have the power and you do not. We're going to show you who is in charge. So Jesus here is both victim and victor, right? But right now, because he's crucified, he's a victim of this Roman executionary power and display of pomp and and right but he's crucified with two other people but like you said and you're right that but this um you know um, painter wanted to kind of depict jesus slightly different he's not merely a victim he's also a victor he's haloed that means there's something sacred or holy about him and they did not want to uh, depict jesus as naked but guess what is that an actual depiction of what you think happened to Jesus? No. I'm pretty sure that he suffered the same lot as the other two. Same crucifixion, same kind of lack of clothing, and maybe just with, with the exception of loincloth, and that's what we understand. So, so then you can see how the, the painters really wanted to do, uh, pay homage and do justice by Jesus by presenting him more presentable, when in fact he was victimized for the sake of this world. Now, let's look at this one then. This is now clearly Christ as victor, right? And so this is actually from a church in um, Istanbul, uh, Turkey, and it's a church in, um, church in Kora, Church of Kora. What do you see here? I mean, can you see it okay? All right, so um, this is Jesus. I mean, that's probably easy to all right. I mean, when in doubt, go with Jesus. He will never lead you astray, as people say, right? So, and what about the, the, the one here and the one there? Who do you think they are? Can you see them? So one's male, the one on, on my left or on our left, and female here on our right. Two people, male, female, who might they be? Close. Not Martha. Go further back. Go further back. Further back yet. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Thank you very much. So Jesus is holding their hands. So holding their hands signifies what? Yes, bringing them back and their salvation. So this is the picture of Jesus restoring all things to God's appointed and preordained glory. That means Adam and Eve, they fell, right? It is thanks to them we have inherited our own problems. But then in this beautiful, and if you actually go to this church, it's in the apse of this building at the church. And their words cannot describe it. It's, it's not well lit. It's not like, it's not, it doesn't have electrical lights, right? Ele electric lights. And yet, when you go there, it's the brilliance of this artwork that actually just... And I just stood there. I went to give a series of lectures at the University of Istanbul on, on the Trinity, actually. And, and then, and then the, the missionary who is uh, uh, um, uh, one of the leading Arabic scholars, who's also a missionary, a Christian, he said, let me take you to this church. He said, we can go to Hagia Sophia if you want, but I want to take you to this, this one. And he took me there, and I just stood in front of it, and just, I just began weeping. 
just seeing the picture of Jesus holding, and he, when he explained, and he asked me, like, who do you think they are? And I somehow, it's not because I'm smarter than you, but I somehow look at it, and he goes, think, go way, way back. I said, Adam and Eve. And he goes, think about this, that Jesus is holding, and he goes, I don't know what your theology says about what happened to Adam and Eve, but he goes, many evangelical Protestants think that, like, Adam and Eve went to hell because they, like, disobeyed, right? They must have gone to hell. Like, like no, Jesus is holding their hand and is restoring them to dignity. And then, do you see something at the bottom here? I mean, you probably can't see it. You see, looks, okay, I know, all right. You can't tell, it's a corpse, right? And so Jesus is actually stomping over, stepping onto uh, Satan as he's kind of mummified, right? And so Jesus' ultimate victory over sin, Satan, and hell, and death is going to be, you know, is, is beautifully depicted in him holding on to the hands of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and they are now in the position of redemption and restored glory. And then this ancient foe called Satan will be no more. So let me wrap up this way and we'll have our, our conversation. However you think about this matter, it is abundantly clear to me that Reformed theology in its best, best of Christian theology always points the student and the learner back to the source of it all. That it is about exitus and reditus. That it is that we recognize that everything comes from God and everything will ultimately return to God. That actually simplifies our life's pursuit, our many busy endeavors. It is really about going from God and returning to God. Your daily life has that rhythm of going from God and returning to God. My daily life is also about that. Then you add and multiply these daily lives, and then what you end up with is some total of your life journey. May the Lord continue to imbue you, imbue your life with his grace as we come to recognize again and again, yes, I've come from God and I am returning to God. And in that moment, in that rhythm of discovery of God's grace, May he continue to empower you and in, enlighten you and embolden you and encourage you as you seek to follow the God of Augustine and of Calvin and of your mothers and your fathers and of your sisters and your brothers and your fellow students here at ITSLA. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we have time for a Q&A, I think, and uh, we will, um, and like we did yesterday, I don't want to get myself in trouble by not picking on some people who've been waiting a while, so the mic is going around, whoever has the mic has the power to speak, all right, so off we go. Yeah, thank you so much for all the teachings. Yep. So my question is from like, as you say, from the Augustine, everything returns to the source of all, mm. the three in God. So uh, do you believe like, is there a life after death for other beings also like animal, birds, as the book of Ecclesiastes says, you know, uh, chapter three, verse 21. Thank you. Wow, okay, that's from the left field. So Ecclesiastes 3.21 says, it says what about the, the it, it seems to posit that when they are dead, they are dead and nothing, right? I mean, is that what you're referring to? Uh, that's like, who knows, you know. Um, yeah, who knows what, ha yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. Well, and you're from Nepal, right? Nepal, Nepal yeah, okay. Because like in Hinduism, you know, yeah. people believe that uh, animals have a soul and spirit, you know, yeah. Deeper. Yeah. So, so you are quoting like everything you know goes to God. So, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, um, great question. So, you know, um, as people have said, at least in Western cultures or Western Christianity too, people have asked, "Do do dogs go to heaven?" <laughs> you know, you have you heard that question before? I mean. Um, 
My wife, who's probably watching this live stream right now, she has taught me something very, very helpful. We have a, I think I mentioned to you, I, in, I introduced to you our dog, Baxter. He's a terrible, like terrifying, terrifyingly scary dog. He's seven pounds heavy, he's a multi-poo. No, he's actually the sweetest dog you'll ever meet, right? And she always sings, holds him like this, and then she sings, Jesus, like, yes, Jesus loves Baxter. Yes, Jesus loves Baxter. So then we were thinking about the fact that, okay, if Jesus loves Baxter, I mean, is that true? Can I actually think of the possibility of divine canine love, right? I mean, we posit that divine human love is possible, right? So is it possible? And this is something I've learned from my Bible reading today. I do something called Nikki Gumbel's uh, daily Bible reading. Uh, my wife has encouraged me to do that. Today I read something and I want to read something to you. Can I borrow your Bible for a second? Yeah. Now, I've been reading the Bible for a, quite a while, but I didn't see this. This is really embarrassing, but it is. you will know what I mean when I s tell you what I just saw today for the first time. Okay. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, and I'm not going to tell you what verse, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So be fruitful and multiply. To whom did God say this? Human beings, you think, yes? No. I thought, okay, so because God says this, in 128, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over everything that moves on the earth. That we know, right? right. <laughs> this is why I say it's embarrassing. Until today, I never saw that God actually blessed somebody else. God actually, okay, so this is what it says. In 121, God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And here's my question. Could these creatures actually understand? God says something, right? You see what I mean? Yeah. No? So God spoke to humans, and we assume that humans understood, okay, I, I see what you mean. Do you know what I'm getting at? What I'm getting at is something like this, that can God communicate to non-human creatures? Can God, thank you, can God actually speak in a way that to our dog Baxter that to think about divine canine, canine meaning dogs, divine canine love is not some fatuous idea that it may actually be true. You see what I mean? Then if that is the case, if God is a creator and creator of all things, and you know what I realize that what I think is conceptually impossible is in many ways absolutely possible with God. So, I mean, some of you are saying, of course it is possible that God actually, so now, I, again, did you know that Genesis 122? I mean, I didn't know until today. I've been teaching theology and history of Christianity for a quarter century, and until today, I didn't know that. It's kind of embarrassing, right? I mean, did you, I mean you're an Old Testament scholar. Did you know that, James? I, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I don't hear you in Old Testament. You're the president of this school, so you better answer wisely. I mean, I haven't thought in that way. Right? Yes, yeah. I know, right? But, like, you see what I mean? Like, it really struck me as, like, whoa, I never saw that. That God spoke to these sea creatures, right? Yeah. That they could, I mean, I guess I'm assuming that according to the mind of the writer of Genesis, that sea creatures could actually respond to, or at least be, they're cognizant of what God was, well, you know, dolphins, they communicate, no? I think so. They're, they're, they have their own language. So then, if they can communicate with one another, can they not actually listen to and maybe understand something of their own maker? I don't know. So that's, I'm, I'm leaving it kind of open like that. I'm not going in the way of Hinduism necessarily, but, but I think a, a lot of Christian theology basically said only humans can communicate with God. And I, I don't think so. I mean, so again, I learned that from my wife. When she sings, Jesus loves Baxter, I'm like, does Jesus really love Baxter? And she's like, of course. And I said, oh, I never knew that. <laughs>
But again, it really leaves open that, that, I mean, think about hundreds of billions of galaxies. I mean, I don't like, there's no way I can see them, right? You know what I mean? Like, but, but then if there are all of these galaxies in our universe, in our cosmos, and God is a creator of all, why is it unthinkable that God could actually love a dog? Why is it unthinkable that God could speak to maritime creatures and God could bless them and spoke to them? That there is some kind of tacit or explicit understanding by these creatures before the fall that they could understand something of divine intention. I think there's something really wonderful there. Thank you for that. It was, initially, I thought, oh, crud, how am I going to answer that? But the Lord was gracious, so um, praise God. All right, so who else? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for the lectures. Actually, it's really, really profound. Uh, I, I want to, actually, he, he touched part of my question, and mm. I want to look at the other side of it. Mm. And uh, we are looking at the, 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 the concept of um, um, the emanation. Yes. And creation. Yes. Yeah, because when we talk about oh. um, everything comes out from God. Right. Now, it, it, it could uh, have an undertone of um, uh, emanation because right. everything is returning back to God. Yes. We, 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 we have to have it in perspective because it would suggest maybe Eastern philosophy, which believes that emanation means things went out of God and they can come back to God as drops of little drops of water back to the ocean. Yes. So in this, uh, uh, with what you've said so far, so what is the distinction between everything came out from God and everything is going back to God? Because this seems to be a Hindu philosophy here. I'm, look, I'm trying to look at it. Okay. Because, yes. But because, All right, right, sure. Yes, because in Hinduism, they, they, they actually teach that, you know, that when they talk about God, they are not just looking about a God who created the, the uncaused cause, causing cause, mm. but they're looking about the emanation of the uncaused cause, making everything God. So when we return back to God, we are going back to our source. Mm. So I want you, if you can help, give me some more distinction on this. Uh, thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's. <laughs> Learning a lot here, right? Um, I probably will never talk about this in any lectures. <laughs> All right, so brilliant question. Thank you. Just the question itself has taught me a lot. And I think this is what I would say. That both Aquinas and Augustine and many of these um, kind of orthodox kind of Christian writers have always posited something very important. And that is the creator and creature distinction, right? God is God and we're not, right? There's, I mean, if you read Genesis account of creation, it's very clear in the beginning God, right? So in the beginning God and God does, God speaks and by that speech, by speaking, God creates everything. And you see that kind of similar analog in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was God. And the word was with God and the word was God and everything was created by the word. So. So there's a creator and creature distinction, right? And, and also the other thing is that, that in, in Genesis 1, 26 and 7, that God creates humankind in God's image, right? So there is something really important to remember. I think for, I would say that in a lot of the Western Christian traditions, we have cre emphasized the creator-creature distinction to such an extent that we forget that we were actually created to be like God, right? So remember when the tempter came and the, the tempter was not totally incorrect, right? It says, you be like God, right? And because, and that was the original div, uh, divine design of our, of our creation, that we will, we will be like God, not become God, right? No, but then we are, so what does that mean to image God? And let's think about that. What does that mean to image God? That means, among other things, there are three things. One of that, all three words beginning with the letter R, one is rationality. And traditionally, many have said, okay, what does that mean for humans to image God? That means that we are able to think, think differently than any other creatures, perhaps. Rationality, but also the other thing is relationality, that we are created as relational beings. We are created uh, to, to relate with one another, but ultimately relate with God. And thirdly is regency, R-E-G-E-N-C-Y, that we are call, called and created to rule with God. Now, immediately, when you think about the word rule, we think of 
Oh, that's not good because when we think about ruling, we think about tyrannical ruling, despotic ruling, and autocratic ruling. But God's rule is actually benign rule, perfect rule, but that doesn't rob your own agency and freedom. You see, so we are created, so rationality, relationality, and regency are the kind of attributes, I would say, of the Imago Dei, the image of God. So I do think that, so as creatures, we are called to image God, image God in, in the way that we, we are to be. So our dog, Baxter, sorry to talk about him again. What my job is as Baxter's owner is to image God to Baxter. You know what I mean? That, that I am actually to image the love of God and the relation, you see what I mean? That I am called to, because God says, I want you to go and, you know, be, be fruitful and multiply and subdue. Subduing does not mean that we're going to like put, put it down, right? Subjugate it. But we are called to, again, cultivate this world and govern this world in such a way that people will see, oh, you govern differently. You do your kind of merchandising differently. You do your life differently. There must be a God. You see what I mean? So that is what it means to image God. So that means there is a, yeah, there is a doctrine. There's, there's not a doctrine of emanation as such, but everything does come from God because God creates everything out of nothing, ex nihilo, yes? Creatio ex nihilo. Everything is created by God out of nothing. And yet, because God is the source of all, everything will return to God, not in terms of, I like the idea of water, the, the, the water, you know, the droplets and into the sea, but then that then becomes like ontological fusion, that we become like indistinguishable from God. No, I think even in, in our glorified state, there will be a distinction between God and everything that is not God. And yet, the communion with God and the union with God will be in such a way that we will experience God in ways that we cannot even dream of ex experiencing, right? You see what I mean? Like, if you think that the sweet, there is sweetness in your fellowship with God, in your times of prayer, in your times of meditation, that you experience God to be someone sweeter than anything that you've tasted, someone who is more lovely than anything else that you have experienced, well, if that is your God, then in your glorified state, and you will see God in a way that is, you know, no eyes have seen, no, uh, you know, no mind has conceived, the right? I mean, that's Paul in Ephesians, I think, too, right? No eyes have seen. And, and what God has prepared. What's that? Thank you. <laughs> Again, when I learn from the students here and from the majority world, I don't know about you, but like Western students know their theology well, and a lot of the majority world students, they know their Bible inside out. So thank you. First Corinthians chapter two. Yeah. No eyes that. No. Yes, yes. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Why don't you come up? Like, thank you. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> thank you. And so I mean, that's what I would say that that we cannot even conceptualize or imagine what that is like. And yet God has given that that taste. Right? And so we have tasted the goodness of God. And that's why the psalmist says, come and taste the goodness of God. And so it's an invitation. It's a constant invitation from God. Come and see. As Andrew said, like, come and see. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Like, come and see. So I think there's a constant invitation. So in your ministries, we're inviting. So it's not about you. It's not about me. We're just pointing them to the source of our ultimate, ultimate exit and return. We come from God, we will return to God. Thank you, I've learned a lot from that exchange. And uh, yeah, whoever has the mic, do you have them? Oh, you have the mic and then after that, maybe that, okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. Um, I have really been blessed since yesterday mm. with everything you've said, said, but uh, um, I, I, the idea of um, soul in man and animal, mm communicating with God is a very serious issue. Um, I would have also spoken about hmm. the rectus. Uh, is it rec ret rectus? Reditus, yes. Reditus, uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Um, that should be where I, I think I should start from there hmm. because it's, it's a dangerous idea, I'm sorry to say. Oh, well, it's okay, yeah, thank yeah. you, yes. It's, it sounds dangerous if I bring this before my Christians to say everything. Okay. There is a popular song that I have often corrected my own Christians from singing 
by Nigerian artists. Okay. It says, uh, everything, uh, summer, winter, and autumn, spring, everything you have and everything is you. That means God is everything and everything is God. I like, see, I see. Okay, I see. Okay. Everything, and it's, so it sounds like, you know, if animals themselves or if stones, if stones are God or if these stones can also relate to God, yes, yeah, somehow God can command anything to become anything. But in another sense, no creation mm. relates with God as humans do. And sir, yes, without, right. yeah, without, with, without even uh, a slight or oh, blinking my eyes, I would say that I do not believe that souls, um, uh, animals, um, God loves animals like he loves us. Yes. I, I feel that uh, when we look at animals, the way God treated animals in scripture, he treated animals such as sacrifices. He used animals for mm. sacrifices. Yes. And uh, yes, he says that animals, after the fall, animals yes. will account to him for the blood of every human yes. that the animals have, have taken away. Yes. But when it comes to relation with, with, with God, I, I, I wonder if God loves animals. Like, because yep. when we, the Bible says that God loves us, it's about salvation. That love there, yes. I think it's about the salvific love. Yes. Yes. So, and I don't think that extends to, to animals. Right. Okay. And, I agree with you 100%. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. And, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I was really scared of that. I was really, really scared. I'm not a heretic, please. <laughs> Maybe, James, James, I should give you a money bag. <laughs> So, so that's, give me my check back, dude. <laughs> so Created I confusion if, in our seminar. Yes, if if that is clear, so then I think that the other question yes. was answered already. Yeah. yeah uh, okay. Yes. Uh, actually, let me. Uh, you know, I There's, ask that question. Oh. You know, there are many questions that that uh, <laughs> surround can, this issue. Can yeah. Can Can your brother behind you hear your hand? Yeah. Okay. Howdy. Ah. Uh, I'm a new student. Okay. Um, Complex question, but and cross cultural, cross disciplinary. We've heard in Buddhism about the Buddha and the Buddhisattvas. Yes. The the Buddha reaching nirvana, maybe reaching a state of bliss that's permanent, uh, uh, no God there, but maybe almost a negative theology. And the mm. Buddhisattva is this Buddha who returns from such a state to be compassionate in a certain sense. So mm. we have the model of uh, intense monasticism yep. uh, in the Buddha and intense uh, uh, leadership, spiritual leadership in the community, yep. uh, spiritual leadership. Yep. So then you might uh, try to, um, what's the word, uh, uses, I forget what word, but we'll say coordinate yep. something like Correlation, that. Correlation, yeah. Correlation yep. with yep. something in the Western Christian tradition yeah. about monasticism and then yeah. uh, compassionate spiritual practices. Yeah. And so uh, I, I mentioned that to get across the idea of uh, that a lot of the lecture that dealt with Augustine and then um, contemporary uh, students, you know, or people yeah. who yeah. are shaking trees or yeah. any other equivalent. Yes. Uh, derangements of all sorts, additions, yeah. Yeah. one of the terms we used the other right, day. Right, right. You know, we have all that going on. And, and so uh, Augustine confessing maybe is some sort of even psychotherapy as we understand it in the contemporary world. And then we have the contemporary uh, situation, spirituality. Yeah. And one thing that comes with an overly rationalized society such as ours might be the need to go back to art. Yes. And to things like animal relationships and all sorts of things. So I think of the phrase in a song, Small art and love and beauty, uh, they're grudging, well, I forget how it goes, but small art and love and beauty, mm. they're grudging spirits and you. Uh, but the, oh. the, the, the idea of small arts, like everything we do, waking up, mm. is a, the spiritual activity. Yes. And so a uh, move like at Fuller is the Bram Center and something about the arts yeah. and Christianity. Yeah. 
So I, I see you as emphasizing against what uh, might be called like mimetic uh, desires, acrasia, activities, yeah. you know, yeah, where yeah. we're out of control. We see, let's go back from an overly rationalized, say, theological position to a more mystical and artistic yep. center, yeah. using art from the past to get us to remember yeah. or go back in history to go back to uh, what is already here present. Yes. Now, so Buddhism has that worked out with the monastic versus the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the evangelical. Yeah. The Buddhist sattva as the center for yeah. evangelical Buddhism. Cool. So uh, my question is starting to form. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, so I, because I summarized a little bit about what you're saying, I feel. Yeah, like thank you. Good. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's see. <laughs> Okay, Plato, art, philosophy, uh, what's this down here? <laughs> uh, contemplation, I remember. Yes. One thing I learned from uh, one of the professors who came from Mexico to Cal State LA to talk about the only religious subject was about uh, how monastic traditions in Europe had disappeared in American Protestant yep. whatever. So yes. it, maybe the Lutherans, they said, they have some of that tradition in there. So my question is, mm. <laughs> is... Uh, uh, if you know the Buddha, Buddha versus the Bodhisattva. Yes. So the question is something like, uh, we have lost the orthodox, a little of the orthodox ways of doing things, including theosis, yep, yep. which okay. deals yep. with this main yep. subject, uh, where we become deified rather than sanctified. Right. So my question is... Yes, is, what is the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was a cliffhanger, man. I'm like hanging by a cliff. Like the question is, <laughs> okay, what is I think, it? I think the question for me yes. personally at this moment is yes. something like, are we going off on the wrong path by uh, following Protestantism and lead, continuing to move away from monasticism? If your answer in part is small art and love and beauty mm. uh, to, for an overly rationalized yeah. society, where does monasticism and maybe the monastic tradition, the, uh, the Buddhas may be required with the likeness of Buddha to match the Bodhisattvas. Uh, Confucius needs Taoism. It's stuff like this. You see what I'm getting at? Are we, is the Protestant tradition enough? Right, okay, thank you. So that's the question, right? I think so. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> Under those contexts. Let's go there, okay. <laughs> That's the longest question I've heard. <laughs> That's a great question too. That's a great question. It's just meandering, but we cover like everything. And that's wonderful. I mean, we go from Richard Rohr basically to like Theosis to Bodhisattva to everything artistic and right. Okay. Well, let me answer it in, in, in one word. We should remember this word bodily, body, embodiment. So I think because, so I have often said that there is a real logocentrism within certain brands, certain branches within Protestantism. When I was teaching at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, I have often said this to students. I said, hey, if you're not a good preacher, please celebrate the Eucharist every Sunday. If you're not a good preacher, make sure that you give something else. Like, okay, if not the preached word, then at least the edible word. And, and I was half kidding, but here's why. God has created us as sensory beings. God did not just create us with a bunch of big ears. God has created us with this, the ability to taste. Remember, taste the goodness of God. Taste and see the goodness of God. And so tasting God and smelling, if you can smell the, you know, the wine and the grape juice. So our church, so I've been serving at Christ Press for eight years. I haven't done a lot, but I think I've done one thing pretty decently. That is, I suggested to our last senior pastor, I said, hey, um, we should celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And he's like, well, if we do, then they're going to take it for granted. I said, okay, that may be true. Then we should actually preach once a month too. <laughs> because if you preach every Sunday, they're going to take that for granted. <laughs> so, and they said, oh, do you have something there? Then, we, then he, within a couple of few weeks, we then, he just said, oh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday. 
And it's become such a, and I, when I left Gordon Conwell in 2006, I've heard from a number of people, I was an interim pastor of this church, a PCSA church called Bethany Presbyterian Church in Brookline, Massachusetts. They said something like, hey, Pastor Paul, I don't remember much of your sermons at all. But I remember what you said when I came to take the, the elements from you, saying this is the body broken for you. This is the blood of Jesus shed for you. There's something that is truly inexpressible with words. When human beings come, bodily movement of coming up to receive the element, taking their little wafer and drinking their little you know, wine, wine or grape juice, and in that truly partaking of it, you experience something truly divine and human in the body of Christ broken and blood of Jesus shed. And I do think that when you limit your understanding of your experience of God merely to reading scripture and to praying, I think there's something missing there. I do think that, you know, Protestantism, as good as it is, sometimes we don't know what to do with arts. So we kind of leave it to, and you see what I mean? And the bodily and the corporeal, right? The, 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 the thing that you can, you know, see with your eyes. And I mean, and, and it's, it's that that I think is really, uh, we need that kind of a, a different complementarity within the body of Christ. So right here, in my experience, Though I'm Korean American, in many ways, my understanding of Christianity is really influenced by Augustine and Calvin in my training. But then I've really been able to, and I've been really eager to learn from people from different, and you know, kind of Christians from, and people in general, and Christians in particular from different parts of the world. Like what, you know, what you all have shared, it's like, it's not the kind of stuff that I learn, I mean, engage with every day at Vanderbilt, not that Vanderbilt is worse than ITS is better or the other way around. I learn different things from different people. When I go teach and learn in this Tennessee women's prison, I learn from their stories about, oh, this is how I can think about God. You know, when I, when I was younger, I was a lot smarter. <laughs> no, I wasn't. But, and I used to tell people, you know, I'm going somewhere to teach. I stopped saying that. I, I say things like, I, I'm going there to teach and to learn because I'm a firm believer in lifelong learning. I'm learning from you. I mean, I'm not you know, patronizing you by saying that at all. I, I think I am, if I stop learning in my teaching, then I have no right to be teaching. So thank you for that. And um, thank you for that wonderful set of questions. Yes. I have a question. But I you have a, okay. advocate um, for animals because yes. in, in Latin America, yes. example, animals are not really treated well. But okay. when you come to America, huh. animals are treated very nice and more so <laughs> than humans. Than people. You're right, than people. <laughs> but it's We're just true. saying, right? I'm just but, saying. <laughs> but, but I have to say that because culturally yes. in Latin America and other countries, animals are mistreated. Huh. You come here, you go to jail if you, you know, <laughs> but, but, but I have to say that, that I have a little dog that it's, you know, it's a really, a, I love the little star, you know, she's, yes. she, she's a very nice little dog, but I, I say that my, always, my, I always tell my sister, no, this is an animal, but that doesn't mean I will demean right, the animal. Right. I will abuse the animal yes. because that's what I think we do that in other countries. And so, thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and so, and yeah. so, I think that culturally, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I believe that they are creation, and well, that if yeah, we sure. can love a little animal, if we say we love God, we love our human beings, and we love a little animals yeah. as well. Thank you. Amen and to that. Can I? Can I just say? Can I just make one quick comment to that? Okay, sure, okay. <laughs> because uh, we say that uh, God is restoring everything it was, as it was before. Yeah. And there's no point uh, restoring only the human beings if uh, there's no restoration of the little yes. beautiful birds and the yes. animals that we love, all the fishes, and even the non-living beings, non-living things like the fountains and waters. If there's no that all that beauty, then... There's no point of restoration, I think. Can I just, a, amen, can I just read Isaiah chapter 11? You know that, okay, you know, lion and the lamb, lying together. 
Yes. Does that sound normal to you? No, right? So in that eschatological glory, Isaiah peers into this restored creation and has this kind of snapshot of what it might be. And so let me read for us and, and maybe we can, can we, like, can we finish? Okay, because, all right. So, okay, let's um, end with the Bible. <laughs> and all debates off now, okay? Isaiah chapter 11 Verse 6 and following, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat. Does that happen in Nepal, Nagaland, Nicaragua, was that? <laughs> right? Or Nigeria? I don't know. Certainly not in America. Oh yeah, you're right, in the zoo. They can. All right. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And then watch this. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The lion will become a vegetarian. <laughs> How about that? The infant will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. I mean, that's, I was going to stop there, but you have your hand up there. Okay. <laughs> and you've been ready to get in on this. I am hungry. I got to get some food. I'm just going to get up. All right. I'm loving this. Go ahead, please. Yes. It was me. It was me, actually. Uh, it's uh, David's question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the teaching yesterday and today, yep. and I've been really blessed. But uh, I wanted to ask uh, on on regard to Exodus and Redditus. Yep. Uh huh. So, don't you think that if you end this lecture here, for example, uh, if you are talking to non-theologians, how do we return to God? Everything comes from God and everything returns to God. So yeah. if you end there, people are left asking questions. How do I return to God? So would you please yeah, minister on that? <laughs> okay, so invite me next semester and, and I'll do a module of course on creation and restoration. And we'll spend, and you know, this actually reminds me of when I was younger, I was invited to uh, teach in Ethiopia, okay? And I taught in Addis Ababa in their Evangelical Theological College. And in that student body, there were a number of students who used to be uh, Coptic Christians from Ethiopia. And did you know that in the Coptic tradition, in the Ethiopic tradition, um, Jesus in his glorified state, he has no body. So, I talked about, so I was teaching a course on Christology, and that's why I'm writing a book on Christology, because I was so traumatized in that experience. So like, I was, I was saying that, you know, when we, and we're talking about the glorified state, and I said, you know, just as Jesus has body right now, we too shall have our bodies fully restored and glorified. And the students were really upset. I mean, you're not upset, there's nothing. Like, like they were upset and they told the dean that I'm a heretic. And the dean went to go, and so he's like, he asked me, doctor, are you a heretic? I said, I don't think so. I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not a heretic. I'm, at least I'm not trying to be. <laughs> I'm trying to teach. And then it, it was one of those most memorable teaching experiences. Then we got to kind of get to understand. And they told me that they're, okay, we, many of us come from the tradition where, you know, we, because Jesus' body was necessary for the completion of the work on earth, they said, now that the work is done, Jesus doesn't need a body. I said, well, if that is the case, then how do we account for the bodily? That are we going to be just disembodied spirits in heaven? Is that basically how we think? So we were able to really kind of work through some of these issues. But initially, there were a lot of like, oh, I mean, I, I love to put it like very dangerous to be like, I know, I, I was thinking about Ethiopia. Like, oh, shoot, like, I'm going to be... <laughs> He's going to ask me, like, hey, dude, you're not getting no honorarium from me, man. you got to pay me money because i got to pay there for counseling and therapy sessions, you know, or something, <laughs> prayer meetings or something. But, hey, um, thank you so much. And I'm certainly going to be around for lunch, and we can talk more. But 
Uh, I, I really want to express my deep gratitude for having taught me and having brought me back to that place in Ethiopia, just about just learning about, learning, caring so much about theology because it's a, it's a word from God and word of God that you really believe that to be life-giving and community-transforming and uh, glory-beholding. So thank you. And it's a really a rare insight that, is that a hand up back there? Okay. Yes. All right. You have the okay. You have the mic. You have the mic. Okay. All right. Last one. Last one. Yeah, the very last one. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how the Q and A derailed us. You know, from the Reformed theology lecture to to the animal trajectory that it took. But that's wonderful, though. I brought it up because it's exitus and reditus, and you're like, if everything returns to God, how is that going to be? So go ahead. Okay, Prof. So this is my question. Yep. I heard you quote something about B.B. Warfield. Yes, and his insights on the uh, Augustinian uh, uh, input into the Reformation. Yes, and um, he is um, named to be the father of modern day secessionism. I don't know what you can say about that, especially oh, fa yeah. factoring in the fact that most very prominent Calvinists are very serious secessionists, like Justin Peters and MacArthur. So I okay. don't know what your are Yeah, so um, let me just be very clear. Um, I think um, I'm not a cessationist. It uh, does not make it right or wrong, but as far as I can tell, I don't think the gifts have ceased. B.B. Warfield did say something like that, and there was a very interesting article uh, of, written about 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago or so, by this New Testament scholar named Gary Shogren, uh, S-H-O-G-R-E-N. He wrote about, you know, uh, whether, whether gifts have ceased by looking at the early Christian record, like so second century, third century, Irenaeus of Lyon and, and Tertullian and others, talk, and they were reporting on what they were thinking was still going on. And so, and so I, I was influenced by Professor Shogren because he was my New Testament professor. And, and I learned, okay, you don't have to be you, you can be reformed and non-cessationist. And I think it's an, it's an in-house debate. I don't think someone can say, if you're a continuationist, you're not truly reformed. Was Calvin a cessationist? I think he was. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not a Calvinist in such a way that I feel like I have to agree with. By the way, you don't have to feel any obligation. Oh, you know your Bible so well. So you know, we all ought to be more like the Bereans, yes? Because the Bereans did not care if you're the apostle. <laughs> They wanted to make sure that what you taught actually lined up with scripture. And so um, the ultimate test is not whether we agree with Augustine or Calvin or Aquinas. No, whether how you know, our teachings ultimately line up with the infallible and inerrant word of God. So on that note, I think we can go grab some wonderful, yeah, you have something. It's not a question. It's a comment from Dr. Priski Ladoyo. She requested to read it loud. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lim from another uh, illuminating lecture today. The interesting part is that after yesterday's lecture, I came home wondering why history has placed a lot of uh, emphasis on Western theologians and church fathers while neglecting the impact of people like Augustine of Hippo. I was pleasantly surprised to hear you mention his name at the beginning of your lecture. You have just restored my faith in church history. Thank you. Great way to end. Just thank you once again, and really, really appreciate it. All right. Yes, uh, that will conclude our uh, reform lecture. Uh, let's all thank uh, our Dr. Lim for being here. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank, um, you. thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, what a blessing it is to have such a wonderful, robust dialogue. And I am, uh, I've only been at ITS for six weeks, and I'm so proud of our students here. Because you know what? In China, we go for three days and nights teaching, and, but they don't challenge the teacher. And I love the fact that ITS, <laughs> they don't, they don't, they just listen, they just listen. Uh, they might shake their heads, but they do not challenge. But what I saw today, what I saw today, you have made me so proud because you brought the word of God and compared it. And Imago Dei, we're in the, made in the image of God. Not animals, but we are in the made in the image of God. So I thank you for the clarification, Dr. Lim. I appreciate you. 
we want to invite you back and please accept our invitation when we do. And then maybe go a little longer, right? Yeah, we're so thankful. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> and I really had a joy of uh, um, meeting Dr. Lim, and we had dinner together yesterday. Um, it was just a, um, yeah, just a fun uh, enlightenment, enlightenment um, to be here the last two days. Thank you so much for all of you. And those of you online, I saw Fitzum. I think it's all passes midnight. We're willing to stay up. And, and join us. Thank you, Fitzam. And rest of you, thank you for joining us online. And great question. Let those questions not stop here, but continue into our classroom, continue in our prayer time. My desire is that we draw closer to God because Jesus is coming back. Amen. Right? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. We uh, are so uh, just delighted uh, to be challenged and to be uh, really um, provoked to think uh, beyond what we know. Uh, so the, um, we thank you for sending Dr. Lim to us, ITS, and to really challenge our thoughts and, and what we believe, uh, Lord, and then draw us near to you, closer. And Lord, through uh, last two days, Lord, that all the learning that took place, oh God, help us to be uh, just the uh, disciples of Christ that who will continue to grow and be sanctified each day. We thank you for the lunchtime that we could have. Uh, uh, be with us during our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. Wherever you're now. Yeah, before we go, we're going to take a quick group picture with Dr. Lim. So if you can just kind of come to the front and uh, let's take a group picture. Thank you.